Everybody hear me? Awesome. Who said that? <laughs> I am uh, just so proud to be here. Uh, not in a way that I'm proud of myself, um, but just the way that uh, Cassie and I have been able to be a part of the way God has moved in our life. Um, and just knowing the background of I have in this area. So I'm proud to be here. I'm uh, actually really glad I've been able to get to know some of you, um, get to meet a couple of you each Sunday. Um, not a whole lot, just because I try to spend a little bit of time knowing your name and asking a couple questions. So like Helen, uh, get to see her every Sunday. And Marianne, right? So you just met her this morning. I try to remember it. Um, I, before we get started in the message, I do want to uh, give you kind of my testimony. Uh, just so you guys know a little bit more about me, uh, obviously I think it's important that the more you know about me, you can see where I come from maybe when I uh, speak a message. I think I'll be preaching here maybe three or four times a year. Uh, so I'll kind of give you a little background on my history with church and this area uh, before we get started. But we will be in 1 Timothy 3 if you want to go ahead and maybe find your uh, way there while I'm speaking on that. But uh, my testimony starts uh, really, I think I was eight or nine years old. I know a lot of people uh, maybe had the privilege or the instructions to write down the date that they became um, a Christian. I didn't write that down. I honestly didn't even know that I was supposed to. Uh, so all growing up, uh, the churches I went to, everybody seemed to know the day, time, place, hour, second. And that's became, when they became a Christian. I didn't have any of that. I know when it happened and where it happened, but... Specifically, I don't know all those special details, um, but do you guys, have you ever heard of the Heaven's Gates, Hell's Flames uh, play that they used to do at the First Assembly? Well, that was the first time that I think I became afraid of hell. And if you've seen the play, you would understand why. Like, it, it, it really scares you into feeling like you're going to go to hell tonight on your way home if, if you don't become a Christian. And when they did the altar call, we sat in the balcony as a family and... As, as much pressure as they put on us to come down front um, to, you know, speak a sinner's prayer or whatever it would be, um, I, I didn't go down. But even though I was, like, scared to death in my heart, I, I didn't go down. Um, we went home, and I decided that while I was getting ready for bed, and um, we were in the bathroom, and um, I was deciding, like, I'm going to pray now. So I became a Christian in my bathroom at home. Uh, just a couple roads over. And that is when I know that the Holy Spirit um, filled my heart and I became a Christian. I didn't always live uh, by the scripture or how I should because uh, I was pretty young. I didn't, I didn't really know a whole lot at that point. Uh, but when I became, when I was, I think I was 14 or 15, uh, the church that I went to, which was Wyandotte Free Will Baptist, if you're familiar with this neighborhood, it's just a few roads over. Uh, we would go to church camp and during my first year there is when I was able to pray with another preacher that I didn't even know. Um, and I really felt God's calling on my life to become a preacher. Um, at that time, I actually felt like my calling was for a youth group. And I was still in youth group for quite a while. So it's kind of interesting that God would call me to something that I'm still a part of. So at that point, um, I was, like I said, 14 or 15. I had actually preached until it was time to go to college. Uh, they would do maybe a few times a year where us preacher boys, as they would call us, um, two of my um, good friends, J.D. and Hot Rod, which uh, they're both now doing the same thing. They're still involved, um, still leading and, and preaching. Um, so those two guys are a really part, uh, important part of my um, growing. We were able to study together. We would uh, bounce ideas off each other. And uh, J.D. and I actually went to college at Southeastern Free Will Baptist, which is uh, just close to Raleigh, North Carolina. And I went for a year. He actually finished it all. After a year, I came back home. I came back home for a few reasons, the main one being that I actually at that point felt like God was leading me away from that denomination. And if you know me, I, I don't feel any type of hate or dislike towards anybody that goes to a different denomination, but I just know for, for myself and what I believed uh, was changing, um, and there's nothing wrong with that. 
after I came back home, I, this was in 2007, uh, it was when I met Cassie, which is now my wife, and I decided I need to start looking for a church that both of us can go to, because uh, as things progressed and I felt like we were going to become uh, married, and I proposed. So what my first instinct to do was to go back to my youth pastor that was actually at Wyandotte for Real Baptist. He had since moved on, and uh, the time I was looking for a new church, I bounced around like almost every church in this area. Uh, we stayed at Berean for quite a while, uh, went to a couple of different smaller churches. And Corey uh, Schneer, he was my youth pastor here at Wyandotte, and he was now the lead pastor um, at North Woodbury Alliance, and if you remember that name, that's actually where uh, Dan was the youth pastor. Uh, when I started going there, he had already moved on. I had never met him before, uh, but we ended up at North Woodbury for uh, four or five years, um, and we were the we led the youth there, and we actually lived north of Mansfield. We live out past the airport, so for us to drive that far, it's about 40 minutes. Uh, we were really involved and enjoyed it. Loved the people. Um, still have good friendships there. But the youth ministry started out with just a handful of kids, and we ended up averaging between the 50s and 60s uh, within the four or five years we were there. And it became, honestly, just, it was growing so much, which is good, but it was too much for us to responsibly lead. So we felt uh, after praying and uh, seeking God's wisdom that it would be best for us to move closer to home because we do want to be involved more than what we were um, to see where God can use us. And after visiting a few churches, we didn't know where we would end up. Uh, this was our church home. Uh, so now we're at that point where we're starting uh, the ministry here. And I'll, at, before I finish today, I'll give you a kind of a, a sales pitch on why you should be involved with it. Uh, so before we get into the message, though, I just wanted to give you, like, a little, like I said, a little background on uh, where I come from, why we're here, uh, what led us here. Uh, so before I, I read the, our main text, I'm going to go ahead and pray. God, we uh, just thank you that you've got us all here this morning, that we can worship you. And ultimately, God, that I pray that you are glorified through everything that we do. Um, I pray that you would speak through me. Uh, that would be the words that I would say would be yours, not mine. And I pray that when we leave here today, God, we would have learned something and we can worship you better for that. Um, I pray this all through Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so hopefully by now you're at 1 Timothy 3. And uh, this portion of scripture is very, very popular because of the, the first part of it. But I'm just going to focus on the end, which is 14 to 16. Uh, so I'll read that now. It, and uh, this is a message to Timothy, which is a young preacher. Uh, he says, I hope to come see you soon, but I'm writing these things to you so that if I delay... You may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth or ground of the truth, uh, depending on what version you're reading. Um, great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. The main thing I want to focus on there, and we're going to finish with that after I get through the, the message, is the part that the, the church is the pillar of truth. Uh, so we can go on to the next slide. If you really want to study what the local church is supposed to be about or how it's supposed to be put together, Acts 2 is a perfect place to go uh, for that. And actually, uh, George Bashar, he uh, co-authored a book called Vintage Church. And this is taken out of that book. And this is actually a summary um, of what Acts 2 says the church should be. Uh, so it makes it actually more, a little more simpler to understand. It says, the, I, hope, I hope you can read it. I, I tried my best to make sure the font was large enough. Uh, so hopefully you can read that. But if not, I'll go ahead and read it for you. The local church is a community of regenerated believers who confess Jesus as Christ as Lord. In obedience to Scripture, they organize under qualified leadership gather regularly for preaching and worship. They observe the biblical sacraments of baptism and communion, are unified by the Spirit, are disciplined for holiness, and uh, scatter to fill, fulfill the great commandment and the great commission as missionaries to the world for God's glory and their joy. Uh, so to break those down for you, uh, I'm going to take some of this straight out of his book. But the first one is uh, being the Regenerated Church Membership. 
Uh, the church itself is not made up of a building. It is actually the people and the gather. So when we talk about the church, you can talk about the universal church, which is the, the bride of Christ. Uh, or you can actually talk about the local community. And that's where we're going to focus today is that the church itself is the believers that are, that are gathering. Um, there actually are portions of scripture, though, where that's not always um, the only thing that's involved in a church. In 1 Corinthians 14, it actually um, shows that some unbelievers and outsiders would join uh, with the church to participate in the services they would have, which is why also same as us having visitors on Sundays. Um, and then also the children are welcomed into the church to be loved and served because children, although I, I believe that before the, um, the age of accountability, I think they are going to go to heaven. Uh, if they're not Christians, we do bring them in and serve them so that one day they will become believers. Uh, the second one is qualified leadership. And that's what First Timothy, it says the, the qualifications of the overseers. That as far, if you're going to be a part of the leadership of a church, you, there has to be qualifications for that. Um, some of those I, I take very seriously. Um, and actually this week, uh, just kind of like a rabbit trail, uh, I didn't tell anybody um, until now really, unless you see me at the fair. But I volunteered to help at the fair, and every night after work I would go there and water and feed all the chickens. Uh, <laughs> Before doing that, I had chickens at home. I had never smelled so much bad stuff. Uh, I won't go into all of that, but what that allowed me to do is it took me about two hours to do all of it, to water all of them, go back through and feed all of them, then we would sweep all the wood shavings. I had lots of time to think to myself, and sometimes I felt like God would just like give me little um, golden truths. And something I had seen in here many, many times, uh, as far as First Timothy 3 goes, is that the overseers of the church, whether it be the uh, pastors or deacons, is that they should rule their household well as a requirement. That was what the, one of the things they had to do. And it, 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 while I'm feeding these chickens, and I, I, maybe I'll do a sermon later on what the chickens have taught me about Jesus, um, <laughs> is that it doesn't matter what I do for anybody else if I don't treat my wife correctly. Because it says, I, before I even do ministry, I have to manage my household well. So that was one of the, the cool things that I got this week, and I just thought I would mention that since we were um, already in this passage. Um, and then, like I said, if, as far as God speaking to me, and then the rest of this, as far as qualified leadership, we see in Acts 2, again, and if you haven't read Acts 2, I, I think you should, because it gives you an idea of what the, we're supposed to be like. And in that part, it also sees that the apostles in Acts would do, have leadership roles. There's different leadership roles. Not pastor doesn't do everything. Um, other people in the church would do, have different uh, responsibilities also. Uh, some of them had a unique role in teaching. So some of you have a gift for teaching that you should utilize. And then also uh, some of them would be the people who have the responsibility to make wise decisions. Uh, if you read through there, you'll see that in one day, the church grew by 3,000 people. Like, would we even be prepared if revival uh, came through here and we had 3,000 people, new converts? How would we disciple them? How would we go, like, lead them to Christ and, and grow that relationship? There are certain people in the church that helped out with that, so with discipleship. And then they would also send people like Peter and John to Samaria to confirm basically what churches were doing, that they were doing them correctly. Uh, then there's also the church appointment of elders, uh, which I think we're moving towards that at this church from um, deacons. And then also in Acts 6 is the beginning of, of what we are likely deacons appointed to oversee service. So the, as far as the qualified leadership, that's an important uh, part of the local church. And then preaching and worship, I think that's the most obvious. When you come to church, those are the two things you see uh, regularly. You don't always see um, elder meetings. You don't always see the things going on behind the scenes. Uh, but preaching and worship is, is definitely one of the most important things uh, because that's one of the reasons we gather. We gather to hear God's word uh, so we can serve him better throughout the week. And then we also uh, come here to worship him, that he would be glorified through everything that we do. Um, and then rightly administered sacraments. Uh, that part, it can be a little confusing um, as far as what that means. And obviously there's some churches that believe 
differently on how um, somebody should be baptized or um, how communion and what it means. Uh, but as far as our church, I think most of us would, would understand that uh, the baptism is an outward sign of our um, believing in Christ. And the communion is, is us remembering what Christ has done for us. Uh, we don't believe that those bring salvation, uh, but they, they do have their role in the church. Um, and then five, it says the spirit unity. The church is unified by, the, by God, the Holy Spirit. And in this way, the unified life of the Trinity is manifested among God's people who live in loving unity together as a church. I can't tell you how cool that is to experience when you have a team of people coming together that have the same mind and the same calling and, and are all on the same page. We've experienced that with the last youth group we were at. There's times when it wasn't that way, and you could definitely spirit, see when the spirit of unity wasn't there. But when everything's firing in all cylinders and it's going the way uh, God wanted it to, that's honestly, that's when things start to change. Things start to grow. You see people mature as Christians. Um, and then holiness, uh, the church is a holy people. Um, what, what that means is when they sin, they repent of their sin. Um, if someone should fail to repent, the church and its leaders lovingly enact biblical truth, discipline, in hopes of bringing the sinner to repentance and to reconcile the relationship with God and his people. This is um, the way the church, church should work. I can't say that it always does because uh, it's difficult uh, to do that. And then we have the great commandment to love. And this one is pretty cool because it's something we do to other people. We love other people and they benefit from it, but we also benefit from it. Um, and then I'll, once we get to the next slide, we'll go further there. And then the Great Commission is to evangelize and make disciples. Um, like I explained there, as far as one of the responsibilities of the uh, first apostles uh, was that they would make disciples. They had the church grow very quickly. And uh, we'll go on to the next slide. Uh, and this is what, why is local church important? Um, first and foremost is that Jesus died for the church. If somebody's going to die for something, and especially the one we believe is God, if he died for it, we should probably also appreciate that, right? Um, the local church is the theme of the New Testament. Did you know that most of the New Testament is written to local churches? Whether that be the Corinthians, the Thessalonians, um, the church at Corinth, they're all written to local churches. So if the rest of the Bible and the New Testament is the, the large theme is local church, which is probably the second uh, biggest theme, the first one being the gospel um, and Jesus, uh, you can tell that that is very important. And third, we're commanded to be a part of one. And Hebrews 10, 24, 25 um, gives that. And I think it's pretty often quoted. Uh, we shouldn't neglect the gathering. Um, and also it's where God wants you to utilize your gifts and talents. When I came up here a couple weeks ago and we kind of gave the announcement that I would be helping here, uh, maybe preaching a couple times and also taking over the youth group, I said something that it, you have something that other people need and then you ha have need of what other people have to give. God designed the church so that we would do things for each other. Uh, we would teach our kids the life skills that they need. Uh, one thing that bothers me about some churches, and I, I know some personally that are involved in them, and it's both ways. I, I get bothered by churches that kick out all the old people because they want to be hip and cool, and they think that that's how they draw more crowds. That bothers me uh, because those are the people that have all the life skills and wisdom. Like, we need that. We need to learn from them. But it also bothers me uh, when a church doesn't do anything to help the younger generation and they grow old and die. We need both. Uh, so it's where God wants you to utilize your gifts and talents. That's because we're all supposed to come together and help each other, young and old. And also you're created with a need for unity. The easiest way to tell this is that when God was creating everything, what did he say after he created something? He created light and it was, it was good. He created these animals, all these trees, everything was good. But when he created man, it was the first time he said that it is not good for him to be alone. So right from the get-go, men... 
um, are a perfect example that we're designed and created with a need for community. And I think uh, if you are involved in a local church, you'll appreciate what it has to offer for that. And then last, our slide. Uh, what is the mission of the local church? And we'll finish with this uh, slide. Is One, it's for God. While there can be a healthy debate about the aim of the church and her mission, the primary outcome of our existence as a local community is the glory of God. Therefore, we start with a hope that we exist for God. In other words, we want our very being to amplify His. Believing the whole scripture harmonizes and condenses in God's passion to make His glory known throughout the universe. We believe this, too, is the purpose of the church. And Paul writes in Ephesians 3, 20 to 21, it says this, and it's another popular verse, Now to Him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we seek uh, or ask or think according to the power that works within us, to Him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations. If we stick to just that first one, if we desire to um, please God, a lot of this other stuff will fall in line. And second is for people. Yet in the same breath, uh, we add the local church is for people. We don't believe God's passion for himself supplants his love for those he formed in his image. On the contrary, God has chosen to live in relationship with humanity naturally join his eternal future to ours and it is by his choosing that in him we live and move and have our being uh, next in Acts 17 27 uh, but being four people uh, that can be somewhat vague so I'll go a little bit deeper in these next two ones and the first ones are for our city and if you drive out of here today we're rooted in an area that is very diverse uh, Maybe not as diverse as some churches where they're at, but if you drive out of here and look to your left, maybe not literally, but maybe a little bit further down, but to the left you have a growing campus of um, college students. Uh, they obviously just got a new, brand new um, apartment building there. Everything's looking good. It looks like it's growing. And then obviously even further past that you have a booming um, retail, uh, lots of stores, restaurants. Uh, and then when you look to the right, what used to be the place that brought everybody here, you see what's left of a steel mill town. Um, it's not the same as it used to be. So we have some things that look good and they glimmer on the left and the one that had its time isn't quite there anymore. So we gather in this building. Uh, and this building's been around for many, many years and it's went through its own highs and lows. Um, and for Cassie and I, it's a perfect place to gather because when we think of church, I always think of Matthew 5.15, and you guys know the song, Let This Little Light of Mine, I'm Gonna Let It Shine, You're Not Gonna Hide It Under a Bushel. That song, and even Matthew um, chapter 5, verse 15, that tells us that the church does not exist for staying within these walls. It exists so that the world can see it. So when we talk about people, we can talk about our city, I pray that our church... Just like I was a kid when I was able to come here um, and walk through these woods and, and probably cause trouble and come here for VBS, we need to be a church that is a light to this area, our neighborhoods around here, our city. Um, and then the last one here is for the world. It's a little bit more difficult to think that far out. Obviously, we had a missions team that we were able to uh, send from our church. Um, they, everybody that tells me the stories of you know, when they went there, they all love it, would love to go back again. Uh, so we're a church for the world, uh, the local church is, but it's very nature, the gospel birth church is a global church. Uh, this is what we, when you'd say the universal church, the bride of Christ. Uh, Christ was crucified at a crossroad in a growing world. Um, in the midst of a festival he attended by people from many nations, soon after his return to life, the, the gift of the promised spirit resulted in people speaking out in his resurrection story in every language known to man. Um, that's in Acts 2 also. So if you can think of how crazy that would be, that uh, God promised that when he leaves, he's going to send the Holy Spirit down. And it just happens to be at the same time when all these people from all these other nations are at the same place. And when the Holy Spirit comes down, they all start speaking in all these different languages they didn't know they could speak. That's like me trying to speak Spanish or French, um, even though I didn't take the classes or learn anything. 
And uh, he also gave the mandate to us uh, to take his message to all the people on the planet of Earth. Uh, we cannot afford to wait to we're a more mature church, uh, to look outward to the unreached and the under-resourced of the world. Uh, for the very maturing process that we would go through um, is becoming all God has, intend- God has intended us to be is in the going. Uh, Jesus said he would be with us on this mission, even to the most remote, remote parts of the earth. So to be with him is to go. To lose touch with him is to settle and stay. So both for our sake, for we really want Jesus, and for theirs, our hearts are bent to the nations. Our hands open to serve them in his name. And the local church is, like I said, for God, for people, and more specifically is for our city um, and the world. Then I want to go back to the... Uh, our main text here, 1 Timothy three, fourteen and 16, and I'll close with this. I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God. If we look at that, it's pretty simple that if he says that, there is a way for us to behave. Uh, it's not just a free-for-all, uh, but we won't, we won't go all the way into that today. Um, The church is of the living God. It's a pillar and ground of the truth. And that's where I want to stop. Here's what I want to get to and why the church is so important. In this day and age, uh, we look, obviously, this is the political season. And I'm not going to go into who you should vote for or anything. But why is the church important, especially in this time? It's because it's the only place where you can really hear truth. Uh, It's always difficult to try to find out who's not lying. If it wasn't for the local church, and even the smaller ones, it doesn't have to be a large church or a mega church, uh, even the ones that are out in a uh, rural community, if those churches were not there, the the community will fall apart because there's no truth. There's no ground. There's no base for anything. Then a couple weeks ago when I came up here, I I mentioned that I think the local church is more important uh, than a lot of things that even like local government... um, is because of that simple reason. If it wasn't for the church, things would not even be able to stand. And truth is very, very important. It's something I think we need to stand for. It's something that perfect time of the, the year, and like I said, this uh, coming election, is that we don't fall into the traps or, or falling into what people think you should do. But stand by principles. Stand by what is true by God's word. And that's what's going to help our country get back to what it was supposed to be. Um, have, have any of you ever researched or know what the National Monument to the Forefathers are? Not many, too many people do. It's actually uh, the world's largest granite monument. And it's in Plymouth, Massachusetts. And what, the way this ties into the message, if, if you know anything about the uh, pilgrims coming over, it was for religious freedom. Uh, they, they were being punished and... I, some of them being killed just for being Christians. And when they came over here, they left this monument. And it has all over it, it has different um, people and where they're sitting and what they're holding. shows what they're for. And it's almost all biblical. So the way for our community, our world, to get back to what it's supposed to be is it's all right here. It's the truth. So I want you guys to think about that this week, that more than important than anything else we can do um, to help our community is to stand for what's true, stand for the Word of God, and then from there we love God, we love people, and we just let our light shine.